time to get a look at uh, what's moving markets over in Nigeria now. We've been talking about the banks and talking about the brewers there. But Rele Adesine, a head of research at Stanbeck IBTC Bank, is standing by to take a look at the merger agreements that we've seen so far for the rescued banks. A very good morning to you, Rele. Morning, Samantha. You've done a lot of research into uh, what these merged entities will look like. As, as I say, we've had the transaction implementation agreements between Oceanic and uh, EcoBank, Access and Intercontinental, and FCMB and FinBank. Let's start out with the most regent, um, recent merger announcement, that being of EcoBank. Uh, the merged entity will result in 50% or more than 50% of ETI's balance sheet being based in Nigeria. Can ETI manage or does it have the financial muscle to manage uh, this acquisition? Um, well, I think that because of the, the nature of this, 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 these types of deals, because they're sponsored, because um, you know, there, there is a, the AMCON standing by, we think that all three transactions, in fact, are doable without the banks having to generate uh, additional resources. You'll be aware that uh, the ne negative asset values that are in the affected entities will be, will be um, addressed by AMCON, and the, 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 the bonds that Amcom will put into these uh, entities will count as liquid assets. So we anticipate that uh, even if the banks have to pay down the CBN loans that were given to the, to the distressed banks at the outset, um, they will have liquidity ratios of between 55 and 65 percent. So we, we, we are confident that uh, based on our estimates, these transactions can be completed by uh, just using internal resources. Now, right backs um, have helped the likes of Intercontinental and Finbag post profits, but they still have operating losses um, for the first half. Yeah. With that in mind, um, is, as, is Access and Intercontinental, FCM, MB, uh, Finba and Finbank mergers, um, do they have the uh, muscle then to help turn around um, these two rescued lenders and help return them to profitability? Well, see, this this is a this is a very key point, and one of the things that we looked at when we were, when we were trying to gauge the respective positions of these entities, um, all of them have the capital uh, capital base right now to be able to do the transactions and still be compliant in terms of the 10% minimum. But the issue really is that if uh, you know, the combined entities making operating losses, how quickly can these be turned around so that the capital is not eroded? And, and we think that, uh, you know, that there's going to need to be some time given. I mean, I would, I would be surprised if, you know, transactions of this size, if all of the issues were addressed, you know, in the first 12 months. Uh, I mean, obviously, when we get more detail on the, tr on the, on the uh, scheme of merger, we'll, um, we'll get more color on, you know, what management consider to be the low-hanging fruit. But what is notable in all of these, all of these uh, resultant balance sheets is that they will have loan-to-asset ratios of you know fairly significantly uh, levels significantly below the the sort of sector averages so in terms of having interest earning assets on the balance sheet they will have uh, work to do they'll have to deploy this excess liquidity uh, you know onto into gener income generating assets as well as rationalize costs and integrate systems so they have their work cut out and you know for this reason from a capital point of view we're most concerned about the the echo bank uh, oceanic merger because we estimate that based on you know half year financials they will have the most constraints capital position. Now we understand that ETI has been raising capital but it's not clear how much of that is going to end up in Ecobank Nigeria and our feeling is that in this environment the the sort of unspoken floor is more 15 percent capital adequacy as opposed to the regulatory 10 percent so we anticipate that ETI will have to put some fairly sizable amounts of capital into Ecobank Nigeria in order to give it a buffer um, whilst it turns the business around and returns it to profits. But if it is successful it will mean that the merged entity uh, moves into tier one space so it could be uh, quite yes. a competitive bank going forward? Well, yes. I mean, I think that the, the, the thing about this transaction for ETI is that it solves their long-standing uh, conundrum over their strategic positioning in Nigeria. Nigeria was around 30% of the balance sheet, but, but you know, they're still a very small bank in this environment. Uh, so it, it wasn't really feasible to not be in Nigeria, but they needed to ramp up. And with the market dynamics changing as quickly as they are, um, you know, I think that the window of opportunity was closing. So we understand, you know, the push for the transaction uh, without a doubt. You know, once this transaction is done, we estimate that 50, perhaps 55 percent of the ETI balance sheet will be in Nigeria. And, you know, we don't think that's a bad thing given the size of the Nigerian economy and the potential that lies, you know, herein. Um, we just anticipate that there will be some, you know, some time, uh, some, some challenges with regard to integration, uh, with regard to actually uh, 
you know, combining the platforms and, and then facing the market, uh, you know, as a single entity in order to, to, to leverage off this newer, larger position. Um, but if they can execute it well, no, no doubt, it, it transforms the, the ETI proposition without a doubt. Of the three agreements then, uh, which banks do you see having the most synergies between them and where do you see uh, the most successful marriage um, between the banks? Um, well, at the moment, we are liking the FCMB FinBank uh, merger the most, um, largely because we think that uh, it it's looks like the most manageable in terms of just the scale of the respective institutions. Uh, FCMB has the strongest capital position starting off. Uh, it has also the best asset quality position starting off. So they are in a position, I think, where they have some time to you know to work on the integration to work on you know the cost reduction to work on harmonizing the two entities and you know the the, the retail business that, that that FCMB has been uh, moving into and making good progress but up to now has been a very small part of its balance sheet we think that with with Finbank it will be able to uh, to ramp that up uh, and and you know begin to sort of deliver higher margin you know put higher margin assets on the balance sheet to a greater degree than it has done at present now in the end you know FCMB will still be effectively a large tier bank when it does this transaction. But in terms of actually getting the deal done and extracting the benefits, we, we see that deal as the most manageable. I mean, ultimately, um, you know, uh, Access uh, and Intercontinental will, will be the largest of the three. Uh, and you know, in terms of securing uh, a cheap a funding base, you know, this will transform Access Bank's corporate banking effort, which we know is something that has been a key strategic push for it. Um, but you know, it's really just a matter of getting over the humps, uh, ironing out the creases, and, and I think that F FCMB and FinBank will probably be best positioned to do that with the least uh, challenges to their financial performance. But you know, there's very limited detail on this, and we look for more detail to make more comprehensive uh, assessments of, of the situation. But as it stands now, we, we like uh, FCMB and FinBank. The if most. we take these three transactions as a given, uh, post these mergers, what do you make of the emerging landscape that we're seeing in the Nigerian banking sector? and how do you believe uh, these three entities will be able to compete within it? Well, you know, it, we'll go back to the days of old with uh, seven tier one banks, um, but, but within that I suspect that there will be, you know, a, a sort of a, a subset. So you'll have, you know, the old guard of First Bank, Zenith, uh, GT and UBA. Um, and of those four, we think UBA is, is performing the weakest at present, and it's, it, we're still waiting to see signs of, of genuine sort of turnaround there. And then you'll have, you know, the, new, the newbies, as it were. You'll have uh, Union, who's still, which is still a large entity. You'll have uh, Access and Intercontinental, and we'll have you know, Echo Bank and Oceanic. Now, once, you know, if we roll forward, say, three years from now, uh, when all these banks have ironed out their issues and they're competing squarely, if Nigeria remains a very corporate-centric market by then, you know, undoubtedly these banks will dominate. The issue really is that segments like consumer that are completely under under-exploited right now do not necessarily require the same type of scale and relationships that, that uh, you know, that the corporate banks have traditionally, you know, pursued scale, mm -hmm. you know, for. So, so, you know, I think that the smaller banks really have a window of 18 months, two years to really get get this kind of uh, middle market sort of strategy going, this differentiation strategy going in order to actually compete, uh, you know, effectively in, in, within the next three years. And get into that unbanked space, as you say, which is largely uh, untapped at this stage. Really, thanks very much for your time this morning.